Okay, um, good, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second GTAP webinar on baselines for dynamic computable general equilibrium models um, featuring papers from um, the special edition of Journal um, of Global Economic Analysis. Um, we have um, four speakers um, lined up for today, um, speaking for about 10 minutes, 10 minutes each. Um, and um, basically, um, each speaker will, will talk about um, the deep, some some um, details of their um, of their paper um, that that is part of um, the special edition of the JGEA, and um, after um, all our speakers have presented their their respective papers, we will have about um, thirty minutes discussion um, to to open the floor for questions and, and comments and suggestions. Um, without further ado. Um, we, I now turn over um, the, the floor to, to Jean Chateau from um, the International Monetary Fund, who will present characterizing supply side drivers of structural changes in the construction of economic baseline protection. Jean? Thanks. Thank you, uh, Yawin. So I share my screen. Uh, uh, share content. Uh, you see my screen? Yes. Uh, okay, so I'm the only one that doesn't see it. Okay. Uh, how can I remove the next slide thing? Um, if you click on display setting. Yeah. Swap presenter view and slideshow. Okay, thank okay. you. Good morning, everybody, um, or good afternoon. Uh, last week, uh, we've seen some uh, way to calibrate baseline in CG model. Uh, Jean Fouret presented the macro uh, part and how you calibrate uh, aggregate uh, primary factor in the second uh, presentation Moon present the how the change in preference will change the dynamic of a CG baseline and today I will present how the change in supply side driver will uh, change the dynamic of a CG so it's a common paper uh, paper with Erwin Elisa from OECD Caitlin from Bellingham Institute Jean Fouré and David Labor so uh, the paper is in two parts uh, and one part is more about uh, presenting some simple simulation and second part is about what are the common practice to, um, um, to for, the, for the parameters that drive structural change in the CG baseline. So uh, the paper tried to answer to three questions. The first one is what kind of stylized fact we want a CG model to reproduce in the future? The second part is more on what kind uh, of assumption, how when you change assumption about some kind of supply side parameter, you change the economic baseline projection by themselves. And the last part was uh, among all the the team that have participated to the workshop in uh, January 2008, uh, 18. Uh, what are the common practice of all these teams to calibrate this projection with supply side driver? So, what I mean by structural change here is the same in sectoral composition of the economy. More precisely, in the in the paper we. Uh, focus on the supply side of the structural change. Technically, it's all the parameter and the functional form change in the future that will change the structure of the economy. 
The assumption about structural change are rather important, especially for long run issue, because, for example, if you try to do a policy uh, relative to uh, a baseline, you need to know what will be the future composition of the economy in the future. For example, if you do a climate policy, it's different if your uh, structure is oriented their energy intensive industry or if it is more uh, oriented toward uh, service industry. Of course, when you run your CG baseline with some aggregate uh, projection like Jean Fouret present last uh, week, the dynamic of the CG itself will involve uh, some structural change. The composition of the sector will change. But the question in, in our paper is how we can calibrate this structural change, how we, we can do to reproduce some trend we want to reproduce, some desired design trends. So very fastly and technically, if you have your uh, production function or transformation function where you the gross output are, are, are produced using primary factor like capital, labor, but also intermediate demand like uh, construction, energy, etc. Um, the, the goal is to see how, when you change the efficiency of this parameter on the total TFP, you will change the structure, the structure and composition of the economy. So, in the paper, we focus on the various assumptions about capital and, uh, and over primary efficiency factor, but also about the change in primary efficiency, in efficiency of intermediate demand. All the rest, the dynamic of primary factor are in another paper. The change in preference is in another paper of the workshop, and the trade pattern is in the Edis paper that it is going to present after. So, why we do that? This is a, a simple example. Let's focus on China. The simple example is that, as I said, if you run uh, some macroeconomic in your CG model, like here for China, you have, you see, uh, an increase in income per capita uh, in the same thing for US. But if I do no more assumption, I only let the preference changing because they are non rotating in the, in the time. What I see is that it's what I call a naive baseline where I calibrate nothing but the uh, household demand. I see that the structural change I, I obtained in 2050, it's really First, not very different from the one we start from, and also sometimes unrealistic. For example, if I do nothing, I see for both US and China, I have an increase in the share of agriculture, while in historically, the share of agriculture is supposed to fall. Same thing here. Historically, I see a small uh, degrowth, uh, a, a rather increase of uh, services, and in my naive baseline, the services share, it's almost constant. For US, it's even declining. So it means that we need to act on some supply side of the model, supply side equation to boost the, the shift of the structural change toward the, the direction we want. So this is another uh, experiment that we present in the paper. We just do three alternative baseline. The, the, so you have still the naive baseline that uh, show a bad representation of structural change in the future. Then there is three other possibility to change the baseline. One, I, I assume there is a change in efficiency of primary factor. The change is different across sector using information about labor productivity difference across sector. And, capital and land productivity efficiency. And then you see that already you boost a little more the service, much more in line with traditional growth theory that services are increasing where GDP per capita is increasing. You reduce the share of, um, of the of agriculture and you have uh, for China a constant share of industry. Then I can do a second baseline where now I change not the efficiency of the primary factor, but the efficiency of the input output, uh, of the input of the intermediary demand itself. 
So what I'm doing is that I, I boost the share of services in the economy to uh, represent two things. First, the intensification uh, of service in the whole uh, economy uh, to represent the phenomenon like uh, aging or um, 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 uh, more health and more education expenditure. So you change the structure of economy that consume much more of this service economy. And so other kind of assumption that boost uh, the share of service in the economy is that you have even industry are more and more service intensive. This is all the story about the um, uh, information uh, technology that uh, enter into the production process. So here in this experiment, then again, I have a better representation of the evolution of service and, uh, and <clears throat> the industry and the agriculture. And if I make all the assumptions together, then I boost and I have uh, a baseline that is much more realistic relative to what we think are the trends uh, of the future uh, about, uh, about this uh, sectoral composition. So this is the first part of the paper. We study how uh, a lot of change in the different parameter of the function and uh, how to calibrate this structural change with different parameter will imply different outcome of the, of the baseline in the future. The paper also presents so this simple simulation about how, uh, and it shows that if the more you exploiting the degree of liberty freedom you have on the efficiency of intermediate demand and on primary factor, the more you can match some variable in the future and the more you can uh, present realistic baseline in the long run. When we review the, the all the, the model in the workshop in, uh, in 2018, we conclude that the, the team that calibrate both the production parameter and the efficiency generally produce more realistic baseline in the future in terms of sectoral composition of the economy. The review of oh, the review, well, no way. The review of literature also shows that uh, there is no common practice to calibrate sectoral productivity and GDP. Some team are, are calibrated the sectoral labor productivity with um, aggregate TFP by sector. Other team choose to calibrate this uh, productivity by changing the labor efficiency parameter. In both cases, you don't have the same outcome in terms of French income per capita, uh, uh, wage income share and uh, price evolution, but there is no common practice. Almost uh, one third of the team choose to calibrate with labor uh, efficiency. The other part of the team uh, can choose to calibrate with the TFP. Uh, we also see in the review in the review that almost no team use the calibration of capital efficiency to uh, in their construction of the baseline, and this could be a missing part of the story because we see that when we play with uh, capital efficiency we can target over macroeconomic or even a sectoral thing in the future like for example if you want to calibrate a wage income share in the future if constant or growing or degrowing according to the stylized fact but it's uh, it's something that miss in all the model we've seen and uh, to conclude also in the paper, we see that generally there is a lot of uh, team calibrate rather well in the future on the share of energy sector and the agriculture and food sector, uh, mostly because they are interested in this sector, but you have a lot of sector that are absolutely not calibrated in, in the future beyond the fact that you try to reproduce some desired share of um, of industry and agriculture and service. Uh, for example, we can think that uh, targeting some uh, construction service or some energy intensive service uh, trend in the future could be an improvement for 
the if you for example think to energy and climate issue because you you project good uh, energy trend but not the sector that uses this energy like iron and steel so this is also something you see that miss in the cg baseline construction the calibration of specific sector and uh to to conclude i wanted to oh, sorry i skipped the thing i wanted to say that uh what miss also it's some kind of um, effort to compile what could be some kind of still is that fact about structural change uh, in the future and what can what target we could um, um choose in, for the labor or capital share or for the um, uh, industry versus agricultural chair. Generally, it's much more expert judgment about the target we are going to to reach uh, when we do the calibration. But it would be fine if we could uh, isolate some uh, important trends. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Jean, um, for for presenting the, the different ways of. of Calibrating supply side drivers. Um, we now um, move on to, to our next, second um, presenter, um, who is Matthias uh, Feitzel from the European Commission's um, Joint Research Center. He will be presenting on linking global CGD models with um, sectoral models to generate baseline scenarios. Um, Matthias, the floor is yours. Okay. Um. Uh, you're muted. Matthias? Uh, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, it showed unmuted, but apparently uh, it did not really unmute me. Okay, okay I'll try again and uh, let me know if uh, the voice breaks again in between. So the paper I'm presenting um, is dealing with uh, also sectoral detail, um, as we have seen in the presentation before, that's quite relevant. And one way to bring in sectoral detail into CGE models is to use linkages with other more detailed um, models. In this paper, um, as you can see, we've uh, collected uh, a number of authors from various institutions, uh, bringing together their knowledge and knowledge from the literature um, to find uh, where we are in terms of linking, um, what the challenges are. Um, so why are we linking actually CGE models? And um, the motivation for linking is that we typically, um, even though we represent the entire economy uh, in a CGE model, we cannot capture all the details. And sometimes we're really interested in some of the details, so we want to have specific focus there, and therefore we want to have some additional dimensionality um, in that particular as, uh, area of the economy. So this could be um, additional uh, detail on technology, so we could go really deep into a sector uh, by linking with a model that captures um, different production technologies within that sector, so different ways to produce a good or um, different steps of production. Uh, we could also increase the um, time resolution. For example, if you think about uh, renewable electricity from wind or solar, that might be quite different between um, the different seasons within a year that is typically captured in a CGE model, but even like down to days because the sun only shines during the day, for example. Um, we can also increase the spatial resolution. Uh, for example, in agriculture, we might want to take into account that soil and climate can be quite different within um, the region that we depict in the CGE model. And last, we, we might want to take into account uh, physical or biophysical. 
such as uh, yield response to fertilizer or energy conversion coefficients uh, in energy um, models. So uh, having these additional detail then also serves as quality assurance. Um, so we can um, tell a more credible detailed storyline that is consistent uh, with the technological development as it is described in a bottom-up um, baseline. Um, of, ultimately, we're interested in uh, the analysis of a policy shock but uh, model linkage can be quite helpful uh, already for informing how a credible baseline can look like. So um, when we move to the models that have been linked in, in uh, the overview or that we have looked in, in the overview in the paper, um, there's typically a global multi-regional recursive dynamic CGE model that is linked to a more detailed um, model. And most of the things that we have looked at were uh, agricultural or energy partial equilibrium models, where that part of the economy is uh, represented in more detail. Um, and that's understandable because that's also a big focus of, of the research. Um, there have been other models um, such as transport models, land use models, crop models. The later even are not really economic models necessarily, which might make modeling a bit more harder. There's also um, modeling or linking going on not towards more detail, but actually towards uh, a more coarser representation where the economy is uh, described even more aggregate in the, as in the typical CGE model, namely by linking with a mac macroeconomic model. This is then um, done to uh, take on board some uh, detail or a better representation of, for example, investment and savings decision. Um, so how are these different models linked to the CGE? The easiest way would be a one-way link where you take information from the detailed sectoral model uh, and calibrate the CGE model to information that comes out of that model. Uh, of course, we could do this the other way around in uh, studies. So we can take the CGE model and, uh, for example, use uh, sectoral output and then feed that to a, a more detailed bottom-up model. Um, we could, of course, also do it in the two-way linkages. This uh, would uh, allow us for including feedbacks, uh, feeding uh, information between the two models in both directions. And we could even iterate until we come to a solution and both models actually represent the same status. Well, why isn't everybody then doing linkage if it has so much advantages? Um, obviously, uh, linkage comes with challenges. And the most obvious uh, challenges uh, might be related to data aggregation and data definition. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, in, uh, if you look at agricultural modeling, you might be having different uh, regions where uh, a special uh, uh, detailed model is more um, regionally uh, disaggregated. So to actually link it to the uh, CGE model, you need some up or down scaling to make the regional dimension uh, consistent. You could, of course, also think about differences in the sectors that are represented. For example, in energy modeling, uh, energy system models typically dif differentiated with uh, the demand for electricity and heat uh, versus uh, the GTAP data set that uh, aggregates this into a single sector. Likewise, uh, in the uh, coking coal that is being used in the iron and steel sector, energy models typically represent this as a solid fuel. Uh, in GTAP, it comes as part of the petroleum product sector. So there, one needs to be aware of this, uh, especially if uh, the variables exchanged um, are not as consistent as, what, as, one, might, as my, one might want them to be. Um, inconsistency, of course, can also uh, reflect to uh, model scope or model concepts. Um, so it's important to be aware of what are the endogenous and exogenous uh, assumption or uh, variables in the um, partial and uh, general equilibrium models. Um, and then um, this was already uh, somehow uh, touched upon by Jean in the uh, presentation that we have just heard. Even if the two models um, then would allow to calibrate to the same um, quantity outcome uh, in the baseline, if you use different instruments in uh, getting there, uh, a policy shock might uh, potentially have quite different implications in the two models, um, depending on how you actually 
calibrate uh, one model to the other. Um, and finally, maybe even more difficult to uh, deal with are some behavioral assumptions that might be uh, taken into account in the more detailed sectoral model, such as risk, ta risk taking by farmers or modeling of market power, which might not be uh, available in the CGE model. Um, so then uh, there are of course a couple of practical implementation uh, things that one needs to think about. Um, on the technical dimensions, some papers do mention uh, that one needs to have, uh, one needs to be sure that the models converge to each other, but in practical terms, uh, based on the um, experience within our author group and also what we have seen from the literature, that is not really the issue. The more critical limitation though is on resources and time because typically uh, it needs several teams to collaborate or different uh, models that are run then by different teams um, run by different domain experts that might potentially um, uh, use a different language uh, even when they when it comes to to, uh, to talk about uh, some concepts so um, this might be an issue uh, to establish such a link um, because uh, it's, it, it is quite an uh, upfront investment in terms of time and labor. And this is, of course, one of the drawbacks of uh, the linking. Nonetheless, uh, we find that linking um, models can provide additional baseline uh, value when doing a baseline and also doing a policy scenario. So um, it is very well, uh, or it's very important to consider this, this additional gain that you get, even though uh, you have to take also into account the potential additional complexity with that comes with it, or additional um, data or model inconsistency. Um, one can be a bit practical sometimes. I mean, um, we found that in uh, many of the studies that were, uh, well, in, in several studies, um, we were finding that a two-way link actually only has a very minor effect. So you you're not necessarily need to take into account the full feedback effect, but you can maybe um, just calibrate one model to the other, and you already have some some value on how um, uh, yeah the baseline turns out, and then also how the policy scenarios turn out. Um, so unfortunately, we didn't really find too many low hanging fruits where one could directly start from uh, saying, well, we want to implement this here, but there's definitely uh, a number of things that can be done in the future. So I, th I would expect that there is uh, linking to be seen out there. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias, for your presentation on linking global CG models with um, sectoral models. Um, our next presenter is um, Sergei Paltsev from the MIT Joint Program on the Sciences and Policy of Global Change. He will be presenting um, Capturing Key Energy and Emission Trends in CGE Models, Assessment of Status and Remaining Challenges. Um, before I turn over the floor to, to Sergey, I just want to remind all the participants that if you have questions, please feel free to um, write them in the chat box. We have um, a, a discussion later on um, after all the presenters have, have finished presenting their papers where um, we will discuss all your questions and comments. Um, all right, Sergey, floor is yours. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, and hopefully you also uh, can see the slides, right? Yes, you can. Thank you. Okay, now I need to see how I, okay, looks like they're moving. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, uh, I will follow up uh, uh, on uh, uh, two uh, great presentations by uh, Jean Chateau and Matthias Weisselt, uh, because uh, what we need to do in order to capture energy emission trends, uh, we need uh, all those calibrations and all those techniques uh, which were described in, in two previous presentations. Uh, our job was uh, to focus uh, on uh, particular issues. Uh, well, what is the current status? What are the remaining challenges when we are trying to understand better energy and emission? Uh, and here uh, I'm uh, providing you the list of the offers. Uh, well, okay. uh, here uh, I'm providing you the list of the offers, uh, and uh, you can see that. 
uh, the lead offer had uh, a very difficult task uh, of uh, making sure that uh, very different views are represented. Uh, because as you can see, uh, about uh, a lot of modelers uh, who has uh, a lot of experience in modeling energy and uh, emissions. And as a result, we all felt that, well, our approach is the best approach. So uh, uh, my uh, uh, sincere uh, 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 regards uh, to Taran, who unfortunately uh, uh, is uh, not, uh, uh, what, what is not able uh, to present uh, this paper. So I'm presenting this paper, but it was a lot of uh, work of uh, herding the cats and making sure that we have a consistent story. Uh, I see that uh, some of the offers uh, are present on this call. So uh, thank you very much. I enjoyed uh, working uh, together. I think we have a very nice uh, paper. Uh, you can see, well, it's more than 70 pages. So I wouldn't be able, obviously, to cover uh, uh, even some of the aspects which we are uh, discussing there. Uh, but uh, it's uh, available online. I'm reminding you uh, the link. Uh, Feel free to uh, look at the paper, download it, and if you have any questions uh, or uh, follow-up ideas or suggestions, uh, we are uh, more than happy uh, uh, to consider that. So very briefly, what is the goal of this paper and what's uh, in, uh, uh, in our paper? Our focus was on the insights into recent advances uh, into future energy profiles and modeling of the future energy profiles, and uh, the another important component is, well, how to represent the emissions abatement. Uh, we have reviewed 17, what we call state-of-the-art models, uh, where uh, we uh, found a very detailed representation of the energy and uh, emission model. Uh, we decided to divide uh, the paper into separate sections where uh, we focused uh, on the best practices uh, in particular areas which are extremely important uh, for the energy and emission field. Uh, there is a, a special section on fossil fuel extraction, uh, and uh, we felt that it's important to uh, understand and represent uh, because fossil fuels are still uh, the cheapest uh, uh, available fuel. And we need to make sure that we are modeling this uh, competition correctly. Uh, in addition, uh, if we uh, are going to uh, uh, think of uh, uh, well, the future uh, of fossil fuels uh, and uh, providing uh, the low carbon solutions with the carbon capture and storage or converting to hydrogen with carbon capture and storage. So we still need to make sure that we are representing those correctly and uh, we capture them uh, 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 as, uh, as, uh, as detailed as possible. Uh, another important component for fossil fuel extraction, if we are talking about the decarbonization, uh, and again, our paper was mostly focused on the baseline, so we didn't go uh, much uh, into the details of the policies, but that's uh, another very important component because we need to take a look at those regions which are heavily relied on the export of fossil fuels. And we also need to understand, well, what are the options of switching from fossil fuels to uh, other ways and how uh, to make sure that those economies are also developing sustainably. Uh, we provided an overview uh, of the modeling of the uh, traditional conventional fuels, uh, unconventional fuels. And so uh, kind of there are uh, several techniques uh, how to represent well from very simple assumptions to more uh, elaborate techniques. Power generation is another a sector which uh, uh, we put a lot of attention because uh, from most of the models, this is where most of the immediate emission reduction is going to happen. So as a result, power generation uh, deserves a very detailed representation and many models provide that de detailed representation. And when we are saying decarbonizing power generation immediately, one may think about the renewables and that means that we need to deal with the issue of intermittent renewables. So there are different approaches how to deal with intermittency of wind and solar. And again, we describe how in the model like CGE, which are very aggregate by nature uh, and usually solve well annually or even five year steps, how to represent this additional detail uh, uh, in order to capture uh, the intermittency issues correctly. 
And uh, Matthias already uh, 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 elaborated some of the ways how to provide that additional information by LinkedIn. Uh, I'll also provide a couple of, uh, of the uh, ideas uh, at the end of the presentation, what, uh, what we outlined in the paper. Transportation is another uh, very important component uh, and uh, electrifying, obviously, uh, electrifying light duty sector. But transportation is not just about light duty uh, sector. We also uh, need to make sure that we are representing the uh, airline tra uh, transportation, uh, water transportation, heavy duty, and also uh, so all these aspects uh, we try to uh, elaborate on uh, what 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 is the current uh, approaches, what are the current approaches, and what are the ways forward to improve the representation because definitely uh, this area needs a lot of improvement. Uh, manufacturing industry, very briefly, uh, the manufacturing industries uh, uh, incorporate those so-called hard to abate sectors. So it means that we don't really have good solutions for those sectors. And uh, we also provided uh, an overview uh, of the models which provide much more detailed look, for example, at iron and steel industry or cement production industry. So what are the options uh, in, in, uh, in those uh, industries or chemicals where in addition to the use of fossil fuels as energy, there is substantial use of fossil fuels as a feedstock and also related uh, process emissions, which are needed to be represented, especially in uh, chemical sector and cement production sector. Building is very challenging sector. So this is one area where uh, we all modelers uh, need to uh, spend our effort to represent that much better. It is much challenge, much more challenging sector in comparison to our usual approaches because uh, it's a lot of different building designs, a lot of different solutions. But if we really want to get to uh, uh, the decarbonization targets as they are stated, we need to find a way how to decarbonize buildings, how to decarbonize heating buildings, how to decarbonize other energy use in buildings. And well, that's going to be a big challenge, how to represent that in uh, the CGE approach. Uh, we also spend some time on agriculture and forestry, uh, and uh, that's another important component by different uh, assessments. It's 20 to 25 percent of the total uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And so that means that we really need to make sure that we know how to model and what are the solutions for decarbonizing. And we look both at the land use component, but also agricultural uh, emissions related to uh, the uh, livestock, uh, uh, the uh, applications of fertilizers. And so all this uh, uh, modeling uh, is extremely important. Uh, very briefly also, uh, we uh, focused uh, on uh, uh, combining uh, top-down and uh, bottom-up uh, in a particular application to the energy modeling. And uh, we uh, also uh, provided a description what the current models uh, are doing, how uh, they're using that information. Uh, and in the paper, uh, we outlined three different approaches which are currently used. Uh, and so uh, some of the models are using very detailed uh, engineering information in order to endogenize response of the CGE models. Some of the models are simply relying on the outside information, so like International Energy Agency, World Energy Outlook, or some other projections, and uh, they're, they're saying, okay, well, uh, they are experts uh, in the area and they understand where, uh, how, how the, uh, uh, the energy system is developing, and uh, they are basing uh, their assessment on that. And uh, as Matthias already uh, described in the previous presentation, uh, there are ways to, uh, do the linking of the models. And uh, as Matthias described, uh, there are uh, a lot of challenges uh, in that pathway, but uh, that's the most pro promising pathway uh, which we outlined in the paper. So, in short, uh, we thought that uh, our model, uh, our, our paper uh, would be very helpful to those who try to understand, okay, well, what are the current approaches? So, for the modelers who are uh, starting looking at this area in more detail, uh, we provide uh, the description of what models can do now, and much more importantly, what they cannot do now. So that both the modelers, but also decision makers understand the limitations and understand what we can currently provide, but also understand well, well the current limitations and the future need uh, for uh, the model development. So I'll stop here. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Sergey, for your um, presentation on capturing um, the energy and emissions of the PGE model. Our next presenter is Becker's from the World Trade Organization. He will be presenting modeling trade and other economic interaction between countries in baseline projections. Eddie, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to um, present our paper. Can you hear me well and see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so uh, this is joint work with a, a range of co-authors from various institutions. You, you can see them here. Um, and so we looked at both trade interactions. So we looked at, at the different types of economic interactions between countries, not only trade. Um, why is this relevant? Well, this is, of course, relevant for the, the, um, the, the set of papers that will already it fits into the set of papers because we use recursive dynamic CGE models to generate trade projections. But on the other hand, trade relations are also uh, very relevant for other type of projections and how you are um, modeling trade relations and also, for example, the trade balance does matter for energy projections, for example or projections on climate change, where there are emissions in trade. So um, that about the motivation. So there are various choices that a modeler has to make. So that is about the trade structure, the size of elasticity, the modeling of the trade balance, trade growth, uh, possible extensive margin changes, new technologies and trade policies, migration and remittances. Um, I will limit the talk. I will limit myself in the talk mainly to the first three topics. So let's look at the trade structure and the size of elasticity. So here, there is uh, quite a lot of consensus in the field. So based on the Paris workshop, uh, I would say that almost everybody is using an Armington structure with nested preferences. So that means that the substitution elasticity between domestic, um, domestic goods and imported goods is lower than the substitution elasticity between imports from various regions. So there are a couple of alternatives, of course, which are used more in static models. So I've listed here Eaton, Cortum, Ethier, Krugman, and Mallets. So the nice thing of the, you can say, the Ricardian Eaton, Cortum model is that um, it is, has a nicer micro foundation because it's based on the theory of comparative advantage. But as we know, real income effects are very similar. Trade volumes are a bit different. Um, Ether recruitment mallets might be more interesting because we tend to see bigger sectoral shifts. Um, and I think the combination here with dynamics is an open research field. Uh, we didn't find uh, papers that are serious about combining um, monopolistic competition with, uh, with recursive dynamics and making projections, say, until 2050. Then there is, of course, also the alternative. In the academic trade literature, the so-called new quantitative trade literature, uh, trade models, I listed four differences here. I'm going to go into the detail of them. The thing is that so far, dynamic work in this field is limited, although I think it's it's quickly catching up. Um, then when it comes to the size of elasticities, um, an open door variety of estimates, but it's really true. And uh, also the, the different models, they oftentimes the, the estimates that you find across the different sectors really do not correlate. Uh, so that is that is a problem. Um, so I would say when it comes to the nested versus non-nested, uh, there is limited support for nested preferences. I think the contributors from USITC even uh, working on this in, in, in the framework of our paper later on, I think they decided now in some applications not to use nested preferences anymore. Uh, we show in some simulations that this matters, actually. Uh, so, for example, regions that display larger growth, think of the emerging countries with higher uh, uh, tr uh, elasticities between imports from different regions, you're going to see that their share in global, uh, in global trade rises more. But interestingly, their share in global trade rises less when the substitution elasticity between domestic and imported is bigger, and that was actually a puzzle in our in our uh, in our analysis. Uh, you can see the discussion discussion of this in, in the paper. Um, in one sentence, the intuition for that result um, was that if the substitution elasticity 
uh, between domestic and imported was higher than regions like China and India with strong growth, they tend to substitute more actually to domestic demands and therefore they're gonna export less. Or that's at least our explanation for the pattern tracing. Then when it comes to modeling trade balance, there is no consensus in, in projection work okay, with, with recursive dynamic CG models. Some people work with converging trade balances, other people uh, do trade balances based on, on empirics, so Felsen estimated felsen horioka equation, for example. Then other people, they do it based on, you can say, loosely optimizing behavior or trying to mimic optimizing behavior. That is the, the traditional rate of return rule in, in the GTAP model. In the paper, we also classify the models based on the, on the macroeconomic rule, S minus I is X minus M. How do we do that? We say if you uh, if you impose on the model uh, a, a specific not a closure a specification for savings and investment, then exports minus imports cannot also be specified. It's then a residual. Or you uh, can say, for example, I specify my savings, I specify a path for exports minus imports, then investment is going to be a residual. And in this way, we classify the different approaches in, in the models. Um, then we looked at some insights from the international finance literature. I listed them here because I think they're highly relevant. Intertemporal budget constraints matter. Many of, of our papers don't deal with them. A solution then, of course, is to go with the converging trade balances. And so the presence of intertemporal budget constraints is a reason to, to use the converging trade balances. Um, but obviously, this, this is a call again for, for people who are interested to work on this based on data available to extend our modeling with intertemporal budget constraints and also more elements besides the, the, the trade balance in, in the current account. Um, there is some limited work on this now. Then anticipation effects, they of course can be modeled with intertemporal optimization. Uh, I would say they're relevant for a limited but important set of questions. So this is, for example, if you get uh, energy measures and energy policies which are implemented, say, five years from now, then if we have um, intertemporal optimization, we could take that into account. Unfortunately, our recursive dynamic models cannot. Um, then the, some trade balance closures, as I mentioned, they align with intertemporal optimization. But as we see from this international finance literature, uh, empirically, they're all not always doing a great job. Yeah, so when you think about extending our recursive dynamic models with intertemporal optimization, the question is how much you're going to get out of this in terms of um, empirical, uh, getting empirically valid, uh, valid projections. Yeah, and finally, there is some literature on medium run determinants of the trade balance. It would be interesting to see if we can extend our models with it. And the paper again is simulations on this. Uh, you you see that actually the the way we model the trade balance matters quite a bit for the the share of of different regions in, in global trade. Uh, then trade growth. There, the main question is: Is trade going to continue growing much more than real GDP, as has been the case since uh, the Second World War? So that is documented in the paper by, by our author Jean Fouré. Uh, showing that the, the, the elasticity has been ranging in the last 50, 60 years around 1.5. There are various reasons we discuss them for this higher trade growth, uh, for this trade growth higher than, than, than income growth. And so going forward, we think there are really two options. Either you can say, okay, I think that we should target this trade growth, or you say, no, actually, I try to examine what kind of what what kind of trends i can expect in terms of for example digital technologies and e-commerce uh, and how much trade drug growth is that going to be then we have a couple of other topics to finish with so we look at the role of energy prices for trade growth um, we found uh, we find results that are expected this is especially relevant for some regions and some products of course primary goods then when it comes to the modeling of changes in the extensive margin, so that is a shift from zero to non-zero or from non-zero back to zero, we look actually at the GTAP data uh, comparing 2004 with 2014, and we see that the shifts from zero to non-zero are not that big actually. They're in the range of five to 10%, depending on where you put the cutoff. Then we discuss a couple of ways to model this, which has not been applied to dynamic simulations. Again, something that is interesting to work on. 
Then new technologies, this is a field that is going to require a lot of work because basically in our models, we don't have data on tangible and tangible assets. We don't model digital trade again, because the data are not available. There are only scarce policy indicators on this. Also, um, people do not really work with an innovation model. Um, then when it comes to the final last two topics, uh, phasing in future trade policies, there is now the ITC database on tariffs, but uh, where, is, where we still have a challenge is, is when it comes to phasing in NTMs, for example, associated with free trade agreements that have been signed. Finally, migra migration and remittances. Of course, you might say, okay, migration is already part of the UN population projections, but especially for regions that um, see a lot of remittances there, modeling migration explicitly could, could give a big pay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Eddie, for, for your presentation on um, trade and other linkages. Um, at this point, um, I invite all the um, presenters again um, as we start answering um, questions from, from the chat box. Um, and um, the first question is um, for, for Jean. Um, and possibly for, and, and likely for everyone. Um, the first question is from Maria Latore. Um, she's asking, um, this has been particularly relevant in the context of COVID related structural change. What could be a good strategy to include such impact in our near future projection? Um, no, I, I totally agree. Um, I, there is two questions, one after the other about the structural change. I, I wanted to insist on the, the what we did in the in the JETA baseline workshop. It's to look at um, the baseline, not really policy shows. So uh, you can see it, uh, the COVID crisis uh, as a, a shock on the economy, and then you can directly uh, put some change in the structural parameter, like, uh, for example, efficiency, if you want to uh, to shut down the tourism industry, you can put some uh, um, shock in the efficiency parameter of the, of the leisure activities in your model to mimic uh, um, the, the COVID. Um, Dominic, who is here, can have start to do some exercise when you have the consequence of uh, of the COVID uh, C, uh, crisis in a CG model. And I know that other team uh, in the EU work also on the topic. So you you can use this uh, efficiency parameter to mimic uh, the COVID crisis, but at the end. It's not only about uh, efficiency, because a, a shock like the COVID, uh, if you think about the tourism, it's not a, a shock on the supply, it's a shock on the demand. It's a demand shock. The people will not travel and people will not go to hostel and restaurants. So uh, the, it's on the demand side. But uh, I think you can model the COVID crisis with a CG model. Okay, thank you, Jean. Um, Eddie, do you want to also um, comment on this since you presented um, some summaries during the board? Yes, so, so um, I think some of our teams have done own modeling on, on, the, on the COVID crisis. We also did that to, to try to model the shocks. So that is one option. I think another option is to either use, for example, OECD macro projections or IMF macro projections, uh, which show, of course, then that we get this big drop in 2020, 2021, uh, and then recovery. But the thing is, the IMF has already indicated recovery is not going to be complete. So that is going to change the pattern. And then I think when it comes to structural change, the big question is, to what extent do you think that shifts in demand, as Sean pointed out, a lot of the shifts are related to demand, are also uh, are, are going to be permanent, such that uh, we're going to see permanent shifts in, for example, away, for example, from tourism demand. Yeah, I think you you see a lot of comments now where people are arguing there's going to be less demand for air travel. Um, 
And I would look in, into what IATA is writing on this and other experts, and, and based on that, you 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 can try to to discipline your your projections. Oh, I can I can add uh, a little bit on the impact of uh, COVID on energy and emissions, and uh, well. Uh, equally important to try to understand well what would be the reaction of the governments so uh, in the uh, recovery packages what what is support uh, for different options and we can see that the reaction from europe for example is very different from reaction in the united states so as a result uh, you really need to look at uh, those uh, regional policies if you try to understand how things might evolve uh, into the future uh, in terms of the future energy mix so that's on top of the uh, uh, macroeconomic uncertainty and structural changes so there are there is additional uh, level uh, of uh, detail which you need to pay attention to okay um the next well uh, maria is also saying thank you very much for the very insightful presentation um, there's a question from Sayed Shoyab. Um, I would like to know which variable in the GTAP model needs to be shocked if I want to analyze structural changes as, for example, infrastructural change in the economy. Um, I can probably take this on and then Eddie could, could also comment on what um, they did for, for the GTAP um, RD model or the WTO model. Um, so basically, there are a number of um, structural change, or, or there are a number of productivity parameters and, and shift parameters in, in the GTAP RD model that allows you to, um, to do structural change analysis. Um, Eddie, do you want to um, have some further comments? Mm, yeah, I think you, you pointed it out very clearly. So maybe one thing to stress is that these so-called twist parameters, there you shift demand. For example, say when you when you you have a twist parameter in private consumption demand in a cost neutral way. Yeah. And so the question is always when you're looking at a certain structural change, do you think it's reasonable? that uh, the the change in preferences is going to be cost neutral yeah thank you Andy. um just a plug on on the gtap i think jean wanted to add also on right. this well I, I just want to add something because in the question they mentioned the structural change linked to infrastructure or growth uh, i think we, there we have a different issue because if it is an infrastructure uh, oriented structural change, it's no more in your baseline, it's a policy. And then in this case, you cannot just shift the parameter of the demand or the function. You also need to put the cost to, uh, in front of this. Of course, extra infrastructure means that if you invest in infrastructure, you remove money for somewhere else. So just to make the distinction when your structural change is policy driven or it's in the baseline or a shock. So, Thanks. Yeah, that's right. Thank you for clarifying that. So, um, we have another question for Matthias um, from Syed. If I want to link crop model with CGD model, um, do I change the commodity structure of the SAM, which has been taken from the crop model result? Um, yeah, this would be one of the options, but I think what is done typically when, when such links are explored uh, is that you take the physical quantities from the crop model and make sure that trends uh, are um, in line with the CGE model. So it's not just about getting the baseline right, a uh, base year right, but also the trend going forward. And uh, one of the difficulties here is that you typically have different uh, terms of quantities. I mean, in the CG model, you have somewhat uh, base, like base, base year dollars. So you have a, a quantity that's expressed in, in monetary quantities in the base, like base year versus a crop model, which typically operates in ton of grain or so. Uh, so there's a challenge in translating um, these units one to another. Yeah, Sergey also covered this earlier. Sergey, would you want to further comment on, on the energy side? Uh, sorry, could, could you repeat the question? Um, so, 
so the the question is is, is so um, the question was specific to crop models um, linking with G models, um, but in in your case you're you're linking energy models at at, at some instances. Um, so the question is, do you change the the, the SAM structure um, when when you do this? Right. So that's actually a very important question. And uh, well, uh, in our modeling group, uh, we have done uh, both linked into uh, the very detailed land use modeling uh, and crop modeling and the energy modeling. And the uh, important uh, first step uh, when, for example, we have linked our uh, kind of macroeconomic US level model with the very detailed uh, hourly dispatch capacity expansion electricity model is to make sure that you start from uh, consistent assumptions. So if your electricity model is providing very different picture of your electricity sector or the cost of the technologies, well, then you might have trouble uh, in trying to interpret the results. So you need to make sure that you assure consistency. And so this is where, where your expertise uh, needs to uh, uh, step in and you need to kind of way in and realize, well, if you have inconsistency, well, what is the source of that? Is your SAM is a little bit outdated and the new uh, data on renewables, for example, uh, from electricity model uh, needs uh, kind of to overweigh and you need to do the adjustment and rebalancing or the other way around where you need to uh, make sure that uh, your very detailed model is represented. So uh, kind of, you uh, you would need to make your expert judgment one way or another uh, where to trust and what what is the most reasonable but that consistency step uh, is crucial and uh, it's very important to make sure that you're representing the consistent uh, starting point okay thank you sergey um the next question is from jean uh, directed to eddie how about plugging intertemporal budget constraints from more macro models or looking expectations into the CGE baseline? Uh, the follow-up question is, could you see any inconsistency that would appear between the exchange rate of the CGE model and the exchange rate um, from the false looking model? Maybe? Yes, I, I think that that could be a good idea. Um, so one challenge, uh, that is present, I think, is that we would have to include uh, capital income in the model uh, mm -hmm. if we do so. Um, I think Rosan and uh, Brits and Rosan have, yeah. have tried to do so. Um, maybe, Jean, you're working on this. Um, I'm not sure. Then when it comes to the inconsistency on, on exchange rate, yes, I, I given also the way you asked the question, I, I guess probably there there can be there can be a problem there. I think it might especially be related to the fact that um, in CGE models, we, we tend to have a hard time capturing uh, balassa samuelson effects. But maybe you want to elaborate a bit more on, on this. No, 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 no. It, it, it was, uh, I was wondering because we always have this program and to have the current account from uh, more micro funded, so you can do, put it from macro model, but as you said, macro model has a financial view of uh, of, of um, exchange rate, while in CG, it's really based on the on the Ballas Asamerson thing. It's so all, I was just thinking, uh, no, I, I have no idea yet. Yes, no, it's, I, I think modeling the capital account is, um, I think there, Brits and Rosan were definitely in, in the right direction. I think it's, it's important, um, and I think there are actually also some data uh, available at the IMF on uh, as a starting as a starting point for where, like how capital uh, how capital flows are going in the baseline, and then of course we would need we need we would need projections on 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 how that develops over time, and then yeah, yeah. Brits and Rosanne had, had some trouble, especially for small countries. To keep the the development in in check, so some countries I think they became completely dependent on on, uh, on capital income, or they had to pay a lot of uh, a lot of capital you know, capital uh, well interest rate to uh, to uh, to other countries. Okay, merci. Thank you. 
Okay, um, the next question is from um, Dr. Ganesh Kumar. Is there a study on how good earlier baseline project projections compare with SAM for different years for a single country or a group of countries? Yeah, maybe I can say one. I, I think that uh, Dixon and Rimmer have been working on this recently. Um, and we are actually also looking into uh, into the Wyatt database at the moment and trying to link it with a uh, with a recursive dynamic CGE model. Uh, on the energy side, I can add. Uh, well, there is uh, there is new uh, uh, well, standard or new uh, new uh, uh, feature uh, of both World Energy Outlook from International Energy Agency and energy outlook from uh, energy information administration where they compare uh, their projections from the previous editions and so uh, at least at the uh, global level at the level of the us uh, you can take a look how well uh, those agencies were predicting the future uh, i also have a, a separate paper on, on this topic well and uh, as you can imagine uh, it's it's very difficult because, uh, well, whenever we are saying baseline, uh, a lot of policies then later on realized. So I think more appropriate question is to ask, well, if you put some of these shocks in your projections, how well your model is going to capture them? And so I think that uh, uh, like Hankai's and historical, so if you start your model uh, kind of somewhere earlier than uh, your uh, uh, kind of uh, initial uh, period and run the model and try to understand and see well uh, what what are you projecting right and where are you missing the information so uh, I think that's a very important exercise just to give you confidence how well uh, you're making uh, the calibration of the model maybe to add here there is also a study by Shinichiro Fujimori who did the, exactly this approach for energy uh, to see where in a CGE model uh, how, how the calibration would turn out. Okay. Um, next one about um, parameters. Um, given the vast choices of parameters that one can calibrate, um, how does one assess the robustness of it? Well, again, uh, it's a, it's a, in, in a similar uh, fashion as uh, as I just described. Uh, I think what you really want to understand is is your model really capturing the behavior. So, uh, what you can do, you can do those tests. Okay, if it was a price shock, if it was an oil price shock, or if it was some some change, uh, macroeconomic change in the history, does your model capture uh, those changes correctly, because after all, we are not uh, well. Uh, in in I think well, at least in, in our view, in our, in our uh, uh, philosophy of <laughs> if you if you feel uh, uh, how we apply the model, we are not claiming that we are projecting the future. So what we really try to understand are we are we capturing the main dynamics in what if scenarios because. Definitely, a lot of things are going to be different in in uh, in the future, and so uh, the the main idea is: uh, is your model capturing the reaction correctly? Is your model uh, capturing the policy correct? So the baseline calibration is very important for that, uh, but equally important to make sure that uh, the reaction of your model uh, is providing reasonable results. All right, um, Jean, you want? I think you wanted to comment earlier. No, no, I want to say the same thing. Okay. Uh, you're muted, Erwin. Oh, sorry, I forgot about that. Um, we talked about COVID earlier um, on how to include them in the baseline. There's another question from Maria Latore. Um, do long-run trade projections somehow include changes in the basket of exports 
Okay, imports. Is this an important aspect? The, the, oh, is this an important aspect when looking at trading time? Um, yeah, I would say definitely so. So I, I think also the other modelers, uh, they have experience with this. Um, so, for example, if you have changes in, in the number of high-skilled and low-skilled workers or the share of high-skilled and low-skilled workers, and you have information in your baseline data on factor intensity, then this is going to change, uh, change the pattern of specialization. Or, for example, if you have, um, um, say, if, if you have changes in, uh, if you have a structural change, so differences in, in productivity growth, across sector, the sectors, and this could also provoke changes in baskets of, of imports or exports. Or if you have non-homothetic preferences, that, that could be another reason. Uh, if, if they are, like, if they are strong enough, then uh, especially if these preferences are changing, if the, if the income elasticities are changing over time, then this could also change, change baskets of exports and imports. So I, I think this is, yeah, this is an interesting thing to look at. Okay, um, so as, as Eddie mentioned earlier, there's also um, the, the twist parameters um, that, that you can use to, to calibrate your, your export and, and import share. Um, I, there, are, there are no further questions. Perhaps um, each presenter can, can give a one minute um, insight or, or tips for, for all the other participants um, on how to go through these things. They, I'm sure, um, they know that it takes so much time um, to to create or to craft the baseline. Perhaps you could give them a one to two minute um, um, tip on 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 how to go through these things. Jean, um, you want to start? Uh, well, I don't. I don't have. For me, the the conclusion of what I've seen in in, in terms of the uh, supply side part is that i think in uh, for calibrating the baseline we like a lot of um still still as a fact because uh it, okay you always try to reproduce aggregate things that are rather obvious like uh, uh well, the the convergence in income per capita or things like that but when you enter into structural change, the change in composition of uh, economy, you have good insight at the energy and agriculture and food level because you have thousands of, of other models that help you to, to build your baseline. But if you look at uh, other sector, generally you put, uh, it's everywhere it's expert judgment. So I, I think it would be fine if we could work as uh, Eddie mentioned on uh, Trying to exploit the dynamic of the YOD tables to to have some stylized fact about something more than uh, oh agriculture is going to shrink and service is going to increase because I think it's reductive. It's all thanks. Thanks, John. Perhaps um, well, uh, Matthias, some words of wisdom. Okay, well, maybe a bit more general also because there weren't really that many clear direct conclusions coming out of the linking uh, paper that that uh, are obviously game changers where, of course, linking is helpful, but of course it comes with some burden. Uh, and one way of uh, maybe reducing this burden is to foster an exchange between researchers um, working on baselines because it's typically not the prime part of a paper or so that you find in the literature, there you find the uh, method section typically very condensed. And uh, so it needs the, the exchange uh, between researchers. Um, I think the uh, special issue is very helpful in writing actually some, up, uh, some of this knowledge up uh, that, that researchers contribute. And I hope this uh, project um, can continue with the efforts you're doing at Purdue that other institutes, including us uh, at the European Commission are, are up to uh, in making baselines uh, more useful in the future. Thank you, Matthias. Sergey? Uh, I, I actually, <clears throat> I'm very happy that we uh, had a chance to work on this paper uh, because 
well, that made us thinking, at least in, in, in our group, uh, even more about the baselines. Because if you're working energy and environment uh, area, if you're working on climate change and emission reduction, well, when I start working, well, it's about 20 years ago, <clears throat> uh, the baseline was more or less clear. So, well, we had no policy. So the no policy scenario was very easy to identify. It was the problem of what kind of policy you are going to uh, imp impose, so carbon price or emission trading or some other policies. Uh, I think now we are at a situation where we are almost at the opposite. So we know the policies, we know that the world goes to two degree or one and a half degree or net zero, but it's very difficult to understand, well, what is the baseline? Is it like Paris forever? Is it, and so, so what, what are you putting in the baseline? And that's a critical, uh, critical decision because the cost of the policies or well, the reference is going to be very different. What are you comparing to? So if you already put all the policies in your baseline, well, then well, there is no, no change, no, no cost of the policy, right? You're already there. So, so this is where in our area, uh, we would need extremely, uh, uh, be extremely careful well, how, how we are portraying, what is our baseline, what is our so-called business as usual. What is what is the business as usual? Is it decarbonization? Is it new business as usual, or where we are? So uh, the things are get uh, are getting even more complicated. Thank you, Sergey. Eddie. Yes. So uh, maybe three things. Uh, um, first, if if you make a, a baseline focused on trades. There, there is one important outcome variable that you should definitely look at, and that is the, the, the trade to income elasticity. So basically the growth of real trade relative to the growth of, of real income. How does that develop globally and in different regions? And can you explain what is going on? How does it compare to what you see historically? Um, then I would say many other inputs matter for your trade projections, uh, structural change, also changes in savings rates, for example, changes in preferences, uh, changes in a number of high skilled and low skilled workers, um, all kinds of elements where you maybe think at first sight that they are not relevant or not so important for trade actually matter for your trade baseline. And then third, I would say the environment is pretty uncertain that when, when it comes to trade. So I would say make, make scenarios. Uh, so there's both trade policy, but actually also the whole thing with, with the digital technologies and how much of a shift we're going to see to, uh, to services trade. And thank you. Okay. Thank you, Eddie. Um, at, at this point, um, we'll, um, bring the, the meeting to a close, um, let me just um, go through um, what, what has transpired today. Um, Jean Chateau presented on um, supply side drivers, uh, while Matthias um, Feitzel presented on linking CGE models with sectoral models. Sergey Paltsev um, presented on capturing key energy and emission trends, and Eddie Beckers presented on modeling trade and other economic um, interactions between countries. Um, this um, GTAP virtual seminar series um, is being recorded. So if you have uh, missed the previous one, um, you can always go back and, and um, view it again. Um, there's now a, a video um, link associated with it um, after this seminar. We will also distribute uh, a link um, for, for um, this second seminar um, on, on um, baseline um, projections. Um, and, and finally, um, please join me in, in thanking all our presenters, um, Eddie Becker from the WTO, Jean Chateau from the IMF, Sergey Paltsev from the MIT, and Matthias Feitzel from, from the JRC. Um, for um, giving us insights and um, sharing uh, sharing with us um, the results of, of their paper. Um, thank you very much um, to everyone um, for, for participating. And um, thank you again to all the presenters um, for um, keeping your 
um, your schedules and um, being very responsive to, to all the questions. And um, yes, um, so thank you very much and um, hope to see you again um, at some point in, in the next GTAP webinar series. Thank you.